not music. Is not a bat, he's a man who fights crime And we're gonna watch him fight for a minute at a time With John and Will and I guess you just rhyme It's Bat Minute! Attention citizens of Fair Gotham And welcome once again to Bat Minute Forever The show that is happening again, apparently I am one of your hosts, John Parker. Uh, and I am... Uh, um... Oh, I forgot to think of the thing to say. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Leave that in. Yeah, I'm just one of the other... I'm the other host, Niall McGowan. <laughs> <laughs> and we are joined once again by our very special guests. We have Mark and Nathan of the DC Cinematic Minute. Hello. <laughs> howdy, howdy, howdy. <laughs> I did Mark, you got to tell me if we're switching off <laughs> turns. You got to say it before. I never know. I I always do that. People will introduce me, and I'm like, "Do I, do I speak? Who, who speaks first?" Speak <laughs> I think maybe I think it's like etiquette when you do like multiple episodes, and there is like at least two people. I think it's supposed uh, now, obviously, with the you know popularization of podcasts. I think the proper <laughs> etiquette, and it's unspoken, is to let the other person just trade off, mm. and uh, maybe it's a theater thing. I don't know, man. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us again. For an exciting minute, this minute 47, the minute starts with some kind of astral projection, <laughs> and it ends with an elderly gentleman helping a fit young man unpack. Nice work, yes. <laughs> he doesn't get to sit down and rest his feet. No. That's the thing, though. The beginning of this minute was just like, it automatically brought something to mind for me. That I was like, I wonder if John picked up the same thing as well. Ooh. Where like you know it pans out to Bruce and he's it's night time now he's been standing there all this time <laughs> and automatically just thought of like something said not good what's that don't yell at Homer oh wait no that's okay slow he called you slow and just put out Lenny <laughs> like standing in his nightcap like Homer you still here it's like Bruce Wayne has been standing here for what like hours like how long has he been in this yeah. trance hey that that can happen in real life you know with trauma and things but. You would think he would be enough removed from it at this point that this wouldn't happen. Uh, well, it is repressed memories coming back up, so it's maybe he doesn't have any control of that. But, like, I do like the idea that maybe it happens all the time and Alfred just routinely, like, brushes around him and stuff. He's like, oh. Yeah, he just goes into a he's, trance. Yeah. <laughs> he's vacuuming around his feet. <laughs> Wets his pants a little bit because he's just still a terrified guy. <laughs> Yeah, that's what happens when you delve into your memory palace. You know, the whole reason yeah. he wanted was like, uh, Master, Master Bruce, uh, I just want to dust that spot under your feet. <laughs> Move out of the way there, please. <laughs> Maybe that's uh, that's how he passes the time for, you know, during the day. Before You know, obviously, if it's nighttime now, it's, you know, time to be Batman. So during the yeah. day, he just does repressed memories and just goes into a <laughs> traumatic <laughs> trance. Oh, I like yeah. that. He doesn't sleep at all. Yeah. <laughs> he just broods until it's, until it's time to go out there. Yeah. But then we get into the again in, in its original form within the movie, like kind of quite key pieces of dialogue here that at, at the they're just kind of left sort of vague in the finished film where you know Bruce is, he starts talking about like oh it's all happening again like a monster in the shadows two shots it is happening again exactly yeah and the mm -hmm. thing is too because he's already getting mixed up with like. You know the what exactly happened here because he's talking. You know he starts talking like, "Oh, it's happening again." In terms of like Two Face killing Dick Grayson's parents, but he's like, "Oh, two shots." It's like Two Face was shooting a machine gun. Like he had a whole range of shots. <laughs> there, weren't, there weren't no two shots about it. But again, he is mixing it up with his own past at this point. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't thought about that actually. What the hell? That doesn't make any sense because you're meant to think, "Oh, Dick is the new Bruce." Right? Yeah, yeah. I think they do actually within this minute they even kind of visually kind of indicate little little things like that. But like it's just yeah, he's obviously muddling Dick's past with his own past, and it's um again within the the red book cut of this, a lot of this would have and actually even within um you know the original screenplays and the the, the novelization stuff, little details that they cut out of this would have added so much more into Bruce's character at this point because you know what he's feeling now should be like intense guilt in that he's sort of failed and everything. He's supposed to do mm -hmm. like it's happening again. Like that's you know he made this vow, so this the kind of thing that happened to him should never happen again. And like it's 
within the the novelization that they had a whole sequence where Bruce actually had a, a, an opportunity to stop Two Face killing Dick's parents. He hesitated because Two Face had reminded Batman, like, "Oh, you're you're just like you're a killer too. Like you kill people. You're no better than me." Uh, which is you know supposed to be a, a, a play, which was filmed, and then they just yeah. cut it out pretty much instantaneously. Two Face sending that to him because Joel Schumacher was like, "You know what? I don't want to go there." So he cut that out, but it's survived in this novelization form where that would have been the thing that haunted Bruce. Haunted him to the extent that he had the opportunity to shoot Two-Face before he killed the Graysons, hesitated too long, Graysons ended up dead. So he's failed in his vow in that regard as well. So, you know... And oh, I, I like that. That might be too deep for this movie, though. Well, but it's, but it's, a, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. And it's even the fact, too, that, like, who else did he fail? He failed the, the guy who who killed Dick Grayson's parents like he failed Harvey Dent he's he's you know again within the yeah. novelization they have a scene where he vowed to protect Harvey like when they when they got together he's like oh don't you worry I got your back didn't have his back he created the monster that ended up killing Dick Grayson's parents so he failed in that regard as well and it's just like this should be Bruce Wayne at his lowest point he's just like you know and then of course we was talked about within the red red book cut with the thing you can actually get the finished scenes that they ended up deleting from the movie is that like within the red book his father's last diary entry indicates that it's Bruce Wayne's fault that they were even out that night when he is always internally blamed himself because he's just like well Bruce insists we have to go to this thing so and then that was the last Bruce that's the last thing he ever saw of his father was like him essentially confirming his worst fear that they wouldn't even have been out that night if it weren't for you kid. So that's then when he says, like, I killed them, that's what he's supposed to be indicating. He's like, yeah, it's, it's all me. I did all of the, you know, all the, 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 the you know, creating Two-Face stuff. That's all gathered from the novelization. But at least in the the final script version, what they actually shot, what he's saying there is supposed to be like, yeah, it's my fault. My parents are dead. So and then within the final film, that line's just kind of like, I guess you could interpret that what he means, but it's never kind of addressed that clearly in it oh it? i i think it's enough it, it's hinted at because of the you know the visions he's been having and things mm. i got that straight away that yeah he's thinking about his family and he's thinking about dick's family he's comparing the two things and he's failed harvey as you say so he he feels like he's failed Which, everybody going back to yesterday's minute was you know it's one of the things i was saving for today to talk about it's like there's another reason why we don't really need to show who killed his parents because i it, maybe in his mind it doesn't matter and because he's still blaming himself for yeah. it like that's the person he's mad at as him himself and so it doesn't mm-hmm. matter who that person was because it might as well have like a, like a luke skywalker dagobah thing where it's just it's just him killing his own parents and because that's how he's how oh, he that sees it because cool. it's his fault um um, but yeah, it's one of those things. So I, I wonder if, if is this kind of like the implication because of what's happening with Dick Grayson? Is is that where the title kind of comes in? Because I know Batman Forever might just imply that Batman is forever, but is it, could it be just like a constant cycle? Is it one of those like? Is it one of those more? Mm. Um, they do. Depressing. It's it's not as like as, as overtly stated as some films would have it. Where it's like, you know, what are we? Some kind of suicide squad? Like, this, they don't go into that <laughs> level. Uh, but there is a line later on where he's recalling to Chase Meridian and him falling into the cave. And he's like, I was falling. I was falling forever. And it's him recounting seeing the bat and becoming, you know, in his mind, I knew I had to be, you know, become a, a something more and all that kind of thing. So I think the, the title is alluding to, like, yeah, Batman being an internal, uh, e- eternal state within himself and whatnot. Uh, that can't, can't be sated, basically. And it's like, yeah, basically, there's no... Okay, you know, we mentioned it last minute. Like it's like, oh, you can you can avenge your parents one time, but it won't be enough. You'll have to go out and do it again and again and again. Uh, so, uh, so really, we need to call it Batman a robberus. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the thing, though, because that makes it then seem like, holy crap, that's a dark title, though. <laughs> it's just about this guy's yes, the eternal inner torment of this guy, where he eternal just damnation. It's like, yeah, it's just Batman, <laughs> the, the 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 darkness that just won't stop. Basically, <laughs> I mean, it's that whole. Um, what falls is fallen kind of thing. It's just that whole imagery. I have a question about the novelizations. Are those based off of the screenplays to the movie or vice versa? Did the novels come first? Is it uh, what's what, what's the deal with those? Well, the thing is, like the the you get, there's two novelizations. One is done by mm-hmm. uh, Alan Grant, 
Uh, so obviously Sam Neill's character from Jurassic Park uh, came yeah. in. He did a, a, <laughs> a, a kid-friendly novelization, which is a bit sort of, you know, lighten the details mm-hmm. and stuff. That's just kind of, that's pretty much exactly what you see on screen. There's yeah, a, it's really boring. I wouldn't read that one. <laughs> but there's a, uh, a sort of one for everybody uh, done by a guy called Peter David. We've mentioned a couple of times in the show because it's a fascinating read. His one is like he was working off the script and Peter David absolutely despised the script for Batman <laughs> Forever. And he complains in interviews that like they kept sending him rewrites and he has no idea how Akiva like he was stunned when he won an Oscar like Akiva Goldsman he's like I don't know how the hell that guy won anything (laughs) and uh it's like 67 pages into the novelization before he gets to the start of the movie he's setting up so much backstory that the guy's just making up himself so like I think yeah he basically was writing the novelization as they were shooting and they would send him drafts, and then he was just like, I'm just making my own thing, basically. <laughs> like, <I> was... <laughs> Screw you guys. By the time, literally literally within the last 20 pages is the climax. It's just like, oh, Robin's here now. Go to the island. Boom, bam, boom, done. Like, it's just, it, every, it's all the character stuff at the beginning he's interested in. And then any of the action at the end, he's like, don't care anymore. I just want this done. <laughs> so... I feel like you have to have, like certain things on your resume before you're allowed to write a batman story <laughs> you gotta be like a particular i think he, type of i think he's a let's give him a quick google now i think he's like a fantasy novelist i was I gonna he say was a guy that was like a, known it re, like works. it sounds like you're explaining a game of thrones book where it's like here's all this history information here's how it ends mm. <laughs> and then here's the quick battle yeah yeah <laughs> let's see uh oh yeah oh yeah the good yeah he's got he wrote he's written quite recently as well too he's written for aquaman the incredible hulk uh he's done a whole comics yeah did comics uh he did oh. uh, a range of um novels for star trek the next generation uh Holy q squared crap. imzade q in law seems to be a good, you know. oh he's doing q episodes he loves q. oh man <laughs> that's uh that's another particular type of person okay uh uh-huh. Try to say. <laughs> yeah, so he, yeah, he wrote Alien Nation. He's like, oh, he's got like a, a he did some some stuff about King Arthur. He's written for Action Comics, Babylon Five, Captain Marvel, Doctor Who, She Hulk, Spider Man. Like, the guy, yeah, the guy's Whoa. got some gravitas. Basically, is what I'm saying. He's he's got. Was some this gravitas. before this movie though, or after? That's yeah. This is he's been active since 1985, so I think it's like all around. Like so was, he's he's gotten better, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Or at least flesh some things out. Um, I was so. Is the novelization connected to? Um, uh, Bat- is it is it a Batman for Forever and Batman and Robin novelization that are like connected? Um, that the, my question, my point being really is that I would much. I feel like I would much rather read uh, these stories. Like Burton's Batman. Yeah, I feel like you need to see it on screen because of you know set pieces and everything like that. But like, yeah, yeah. When it comes to like Forever and and Batman and Robin and stuff like that. I did like the 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 neon Gotham aesthetic yeah. kind of thing, but I do want to read that story more. Mm. One because I feel like uh, you know watching him as a kid, uh, not a lot of Batman information was retained uh, yeah. for me out of those movies. So I want to like revisit to see what kind of details they actually have, um, even in the script too. I want to see like what uh, you know what Schumacher and all these people are like you know thinking about creating their batman mm. um are the novels connected are there multiple novels uh, there there the is two? a novelization of batman and robin not done by the same guy so no. okay although i can't you, you can get that batman forever novelization though on ebay I, I, like you get it for like probably like three dollars or something i read the whole thing it is great like it's it's he is getting into a lot more of the minutia there's just some silly stuff in there i was like well i wouldn't put that in. <laughs> but like overall I think it's almost going to recognize as being like, yeah, this is what the movie kind of should have been. Really yeah, well, I, I love it, right? But I don't think you could film it the way it's written. You'd have to really change some of it. Yeah. As you say, 99% of it is like character development, which is mm. fine in a way, but you can't have your big blockbuster Batman movie just being people talking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we'll say like, in terms of other novelizations he's done, uh, before this, he did the novelization for The Rocketeer. Uh, and Ooh. then after that, they, they did the Jessica Alba Fantastic Four hulk uh and the incredible hulk like the two unrelated hulk movies uh he did the, the raimi spider-man trilogy and iron man so yeah, guys, he's, he's doing novelizations off of these yeah 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 so now i feel like that 
is that a process of just like, okay, now it's just like a math problem. Let me just get the script and then here's just a novel of it. Is that kind of thing, you know, he's well, pumping them out like that? Honestly, I've not actually looked up those particular no- – now I'm kind of curious, like, throughout the rest of the season. I might try to get a hold of some of these, like, that Iron Man novelization see what he did with that. Because, like, if he's changed so much of Batman forever, like, yeah. to suit what he wants to tell – like yeah. it, it could be the more like oh yeah the, his version of Tony Stark's like a completely different freaking guy. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like he's just like a rogue guy with a pen going ham on comic book yeah. characters. Well, this is the what Incredible I think. Hulk one sounds good because there is a lot of uh, trauma that Bruce Banner would have to deal with. So yeah, yeah, that, that'd be better yeah. as a book. I think that'd be that'd be good because I'm really enjoying at the moment the uh, the Immortal Hulk because there those comics are very deep and very sort of philosophical and things oh, that, fun, and that fun. works it feels like a book he used to do apparently back in the day too like he did the 1980s hulk comics with todd mcfarlane so it's like oh, yeah, yeah. Guy, this guy's this guy's been around he did yeah hulk visionaries so hmm. yeah he's been uh he, he, you know so he is a guy of some some repute but um but anyway <laughs> yeah i'll go back to bruce for one second uh he we were talking about how he's blaming himself and whatnot I know it's easier said than done, right? But you you can't blame yourself for these things. You can't think mm. that way. Like, oh, if we didn't all go out as a family because I wanted to, they wouldn't be dead. That's the most... I mean, this is an obvious thing to say. It's Bruce Wayne. It's the most unhealthy way to live. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's actually it's kind of interesting because, again, saying like, oh, Joel Schumacher cut, cut a lot of the depth out. Uh, in the DVD commentary, he does make a good point where he's like kids you know according to statistics overwhelmingly blame themselves for parents divorces and he's yeah, like yeah. of course that's a ridiculous thing that no child should ever blame themselves for but apparently it does happen and he's just like that's why apparently within the scene he's like that's kind of what i'm going for here as well of like you know that's a that's a he's carrying you know he's hoping maybe he's like maybe some kids would relate to it in some way of like oh you you blame yourself for this thing but at the end you shouldn't and all this kind of thing yeah and it's it's I like that. I think that's cool because it's kind of related to anxiety. It's a similar thing where afterwards, you know, when, you, when you're having problems, you're thinking back over your day and you think to you, you blame yourself for everything that happened and you think everything went wrong mm. and it's you and it's not the case. And, <laughs> and you know it's not the case. <laughs> but that's you can't convince yourself. What you know, but you can't change your thought process. That's the problem. That's the thing, though, like, Bruce Wayne should never listen to this podcast then, because we always blame him for everything. It's like, you got that. He's a psycho killer. He's out there massacring people. And he did. Yes, he did. Say. Yeah, and he did totally screw over Harvey Dent. That was his fault. And God damn it. Oh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. And, you know, he's he's trying to maybe, is he trying to convince himself of the reality? Is that why he's in his head here? Is he like... I'm going to change my thought process a little bit. He's in a little trance, isn't he? He's crossing the hedge. He's a hedge witch. Mm. I think I think it is just that he's like, again, this is a repressed, like this red book thing is new to him. Like he, he's, he remembers the parents dying, but now it's like something about a red book. And I think he's just, he's in his head. He's like, uh, he's, he's just in a kind of in a, in a haze. He doesn't really know what he's saying at the moment. So again, that's why he's just like, oh, I killed them. And like Malfoy's like, what, what did you say? And it's just like, well, Two-Face, he killed those. Although I do like the, the way like, Alfred's just like, no, you said I. I killed him. And it's just weird to hear Michael Michael Goff say him. Like, cause you, I, you should be like, well, sir, you said I killed them. Uh, Does he use a conjecture? Does he use it? Is that what that is? A conjecture? Conjunction? Uh, boy. Con- br- grammar. It sounds right. I think maybe that's uh, Alfred's so particular. He's just like, no, you said I killed him. <laughs> it's like, this. I, oh, like, that's I, wouldn't weird. Get, like, I wouldn't get a detail like that wrong. Yeah, like a like an English person would do. That's why I've not picked up on it, because that's just what we do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think I always picked up on it even when I was a kid, because I always thought it was so weird that Alfred would... It's one of those things that he would never normally do in his own speech. So it's like, he's like, I want to get this exactly right. As if later on, Bruce would be telling them about his repressed memories. And Alfred would be like, well, I remember every detail of everything. <laughs> so, so no repressed memories for the Pennyworths. <laughs> Uh, have they ever shown Bruce Wayne in any media, comic book, movie, anything? Have they ever been like, has he ever seen a therapist? Has that ever at least been tried? Have you ever just like, maybe you should try to see a therapist? <laughs> I think that was the kind of the thing of Chase Meridian. Like the, the the bachelors who introduced her originally, like they just thought, wouldn't it be a fun idea a Batman was hooked up to a therapist? Like, because what would he talk about? Like, you'd have to get into the fact that he's nuts, basically. 
Yeah, but that doesn't come across in the finished product, really, does it? Well, that was a thing in the '90s too. Of as people were really getting into psychiatry, because oh, you I consider like this is like getting into a psychiatrist. I was like, "What are you talking?" <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, it was all the rage. So I'm sure there's more examples, but of course, this is like right before, uh, like the Sopranos <laughs> and stuff was coming out. You know, the entire yeah, but of- Frasier was popular, so I mean, psychiatrists were. <laughs> Well, like the thing is, though, you get yeah Hannibal Lecter, high demand, Fra- Frazier, and then after this, you do get into things of like, oh, the tough guy going in for self examination the tough guy in crisis going in for. So you had analyze this with De Niro, yeah, and then The Sopranos is like, oh yeah, big tough mob boss yeah. has to go in for therapy because he can't cope anymore. So, um, so it's the departed. The, <laughs> the DiCaprio <laughs> also goes through it. He's oh, he's he's having a relationship. You have with uh, you have yeah. anger yeah. management. Um, <laughs> With Jack Nicholson, yep. uh huh. A- Adam Sandler and Jack Nicholson got that one. <laughs> I got Jack Nicholson in, in both that and the party. Maybe Jack, and he was in Batman too. Oh my God, it's all coming together. Just get, we gotta get the Sandman in the next one. Um, uh, there was a thing in New Fifty Two, um, right before it ended, um, during Batman Endgame, where him and Joker had a little fight, and then they kind of got, uh, they were some weird underground thing, and there was, like, you know, lava or some goo that was around them. Anyway, they both ended up, quote-unquote, dying, um, but, like, the thing that was around them ended up healing them and uh, kind of healing, like, his brain. Uh, Batman, like, had, like, brain damage or something like that, so it started healing it, but it was removing, like, the traumatic parts out of it. So... He ended up being Bruce Wayne, kind of not really knowing who he was, but he was just, like, helping out. And some girl found him and, like, started having a relationship with him. And she kind of, like, worked with, like, like in a daycare or something like that. So, like, Bruce was playing with kids and, like, like being all happy and nice and sunshine and rainbow and stuff like that. So, in a way, <laughs> I think that was, like, a therapeutic period for Batman uh, that was actually written in comics. And then eventually he ended up just <laughs> repressing he slipped into in the that shower. He going <laughs> back, as they as they say, going back to being you know Batman because that's that's who he is. It's like oh, so like you're saying that he he was cured and he was healed and he wasn't a crazy person anymore. And then he repressed and and regressed into it. Okay, yeah. got it. I know. Kind of, it's, it's, um, it strikes me as a bit too like. Oh, it turns out Homer Simpson's that way is because he shoved the crayon up his nose when he was a kid. Yeah. It's just like, oh, this one episode, he gets it out, and he's he's a different person. Nope, he's back to Homer now. It's like, eh. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny, but at the same time, I don't really mm. like it. <laughs> I was like, he'd be watching that episode. Was it funny, John? <laughs> like, I think at the time, um, I was like, no, this is terrible. That was horrible. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's not, it's not a good episode, but, you know, it, it's, it's in the moment, it's funny until you sit down and go, hang on a second. That's dumb. <laughs> Have you guys uh, talked about um, having a blonde Batman, bl- blonde Bruce Wayne uh, in this yet? Well, just how different it is, or? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's not like, um, and it really gets me when I see scenes like in the manor or in like a dress uh, or dress up uh, dress up oh, geez what is he what, what the hell am i trying to say tux nice ah. gatsby get up whatever um there was also batman uh what's his name sir jorah in oh Titan yeah batman Ian, and that kind of that that threw me for a little bit and Ling. i think it was mainly his voice to be honest with you it was like i i don't know i didn't really buy it all that much but um, I'm not a stickler really for those things. You know, if you're cast as the character, you know, that's what y- you, that's how the character is portrayed. Um, you know, obviously Val Kilmer was probably like, Hey, I'm not putting any hair dye in or, or whatever. Um, but anyway, uh, it's kind of like a whole, like, you know, when Daniel Craig became Batman or Batman, <laughs> James Bond, <laughs> uh, James Bond, it was like, yeah, it was like, Oh yeah. You know, he did such a good performance that, you know, I wasn't really paying attention to his eyebrows. But right now, Val Kilmer, I am looking at your eyebrows, dude. And I don't know about it. I, I'm not I buying like, him. I like Val Kilmer as uh, Bruce Wayne here. I, I really, I've always really enjoyed his performance. And I think uh, to me, it's oh. always more like, and I, and I try to do this. I did this with, like you said, the um, Sir Jorah in Titans, where as when they are actually just Bruce Wayne, and you kind of do that thing from Dark Knight where you just kind of cover the top half of their face and imagine if that's just Batman yeah. talking right there. I'd be like, okay, I buy it. Oh, yeah. And what, 
Yeah, mm-hmm. his jawline. I mean, he was cast for his jawline. But I get no, that. but even just him talking <laughs> right there, this whole minute, I'm like, that's Bruce. Uh, that's Batman. Like, I buy that you're Batman. Mm-hmm. With George eh. Clooney, I'm like, eh, not so He's much. Too quiet. No, I'm <laughs> and it's George then, Clooney. I'm the same though. I used to always think the other way around until we sort of well, until I watched this one final time before we did the show, and I've really come around to like Val Kilmer to a point. I mean, he's not Michael Keaton. No, but I, I especially think he's a like too his... soft-spoken. He's like, very quiet. soft-spoken. It's not like um, it's and it's like it, it's like especially in these scenes, I feel like it's supposed to depict a brooding character, mm. but it seems like Val Kilmer can't really do brooding and anger or something. It seems like he's just yeah. doing like subtle, and it's like okay, well then just like play down the mm. dialogue or something. I like when he's playing. I've said this before. I think I like him as Batman. Yeah, I don't really like him as Bruce. He doesn't have any nuance to him as Bruce. <laughs> I do have uh, some notes here, though, because we're talking about things that, like, oh, that were you know missing from the final film that they cut out, and uh, I went down a little internet hole of like, oh, like Val Kilmer, within his varied career, celebrated career, he's actually been approached for several projects that he turned down. And I'm like, oh, it would have been. I just kind of got into a thing. I was like, wouldn't it be a, a, like weird if Val Kilmer was actually in these things and stuff? Like, mm. so I started looking into projects that, yeah, that he, that he, you know, roles he was offered that he went like, nah. And like, what what world would we be living in if Val Kilmer had taken these parts? Because <laughs> uh, he got like, well, actually, in the weird enough, the original version of Captain America, the 1990 Captain America, he was offered that part. Uh, and he turned it down to do the doors, which I think was probably a good choice <laughs> at the end of the day for everybody. Yes, really, because it's kind of like I, I would have thought at that point too that they wouldn't dare go near Val Kilmer for that. Like the biggest people they got in that movie was like Ned Beatty. So it's like, how do, how do you think you're going to get friggin' Iceman from Top Gun to play to play this guy? Like he's he's way too big at that point for this. But of course, they obviously went on to do the doors with with Oliver Stone. Did a you know fantastic job as as Jim Morrison for that. Mm. Talking about working him working with Oliver Stone, also auditioned for the part of you know Willem Dafoe's character in Platoon, uh, and just really enjoyed reading about it because basically Oliver Stone was just like yeah he was this weirdo, and at, th- at that point I didn't want to work with him. <laughs> oh yeah, so apparently like he acted Val Kilmer actively chased Oliver Stone down to be in the movie. Uh, he said to be, you know, uh, he wanted to be in Platoon, but he was impossible. Uh, during the auditions, he was so out there. He's sort of eccentric. There are a lot of eccentric actors, but he was really out there. Uh, he did a strange audition for Elias, uh, and he shot he shot down his own audition. He was lying on a table, kind of doing like a Jim Morrison Im- imitation. And he starts going on about like stuff that was like he was pretending to be like an Indian shaman and stuff. <laughs> and like, all of a sudden, I was like, no, get the hell out. <laughs> but again, because we just know various stories of Al Kilmer being difficult and being a weirdo uh and they, you know apparently then when they did work on the doors together he was saying like oh he was a nightmare to work on with him during that as well because val Kilmer did all his own vocals as jim morrison so when you watch watching the movie you're like oh this is the doors they're, they're just playing the record no that's val Kilmer actually singing exactly like jim morrison but he said like um we could do uh several takes as long as his voice held out but that was another issue for him was fatigue uh, you couldn't push him like you could push an opera star He's got lungs and he's going to get tired. And of course, Val, being a, of an extravagant mentality, would oh. melodramatize his fatigue. That drove everyone on set a bit crazy. So he had so many massages. The massage bill on that <laughs> film was $20,000. Uh, and for a big guy who's strong looking, he wasn't that strong. <laughs> he was always getting tired. It's like, oh, I feel withered. Just collapses like a Victorian lady. And apparently he was doing a lot of his own fights in the bat suit. So I don't know if maybe that because him and Joel Schumacher ended up hating each other, like the oh, point yeah. where I think Joel Schumacher was going to offer him a role in A Time to Kill, and then at, by the end of the production of Batman Forever, he's like, "Never again! I will never work with that man again." So I'm wondering if it was like, "Oh yeah, I'm going to insist I'm fighting in the bat suit," but also, "Oh, I need a massage, Joel. <laughs> like I'm so fatigued." <laughs> and all this. Surely they could have like got a deal from a massage person, like stick around for a few weeks <laughs> you know not pay it sounds like they were paying for them each time like here's another 200 dollars. maybe because of whole, like room service maybe they just didn't think it would need to do it and then all of a sudden it's just like <laughs> val kilmer's called the masseuse up three times a day every day yeah. and not told anybody until the end of production he just presents them with the bill <laughs> but then apparently he was also uh offered well i think he pursued uh matthew modine's role in full metal jackets got turned down 
apparently he was supposed to play the Patrick Swayze part in Dirty Dancing. Uh, but he, he, I he, could he, see that. Yeah, we could totally see that. Uh, he turned that down because he didn't want to be typecast as a hunk. Uh, which is, I don't know, fair enough. Uh, and then the one that really got me, that I was like, holy crap, what kind of world would we be living in? Is that David Lynch actively pursued him to be the star of Blue Velvet, uh, offered oh. him the role, and Val turned it down because he said at that point he was too shy. And he said this the, the script that he saw was complete pornography. It basically he, is. I like the movie, but it is. But he's, he's saying, like, when he saw the finished film, he's like, I would have starred in that because that's oh. way, way tamer. But he's like, the version, the, 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 the script he pitched me was pure pornography, and I was way too shy to do that at the time. Uh, but then he's also said, like, well, I also was drastically in love with Isabella Rossellini, so I would have done it for free. But, like, <laughs> think of things like that because, like, you know, obviously David Lynch worked with Kyle MacLachlan on, on Dune. And then they, they kind of redeemed the relationship through doing Blue Velvet. And that's what brings you to Agent Dale Cooper in, in Twin Peaks. It's like, oh, yeah, of course, Kyle McLaughlin. If Val Kilmer had played <laughs> Jeffrey Beaumont in Blue Velvet, would Val Kilmer had then played Agent Dale Cooper in it's Twin Peaks? It's possible. I couldn't see him as Cooper, though. I, he looks more like, um, what's his face from, from Fire Walk With Me, the movie? Oh, Chris Isaac. Chris like, Isaac. He's got a Chris Isaac vibe. Yeah, that actually would have been like, and also too because Chris Isaac was paired up with uh, Kiefer Sutherland, and apparently mm. he uh, Valcom was al- also offered the Kiefer Sutherland part in Flatliners. Turned that down. As well. What hasn't he been offered? <laughs> I think it was just one of those yeah. things. Like that was, um, I think we did it in season one as well. We had like all Jack Nicholson's things he turned down. It was like literally every role in the, the 1970s is like Jack Nicholson could have been Michael Corleone in The Godfather, <laughs> but he turned it down. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. So but, could I. I could have been, but I wasn't born. Mm-hmm. But then, as too, like if that, what would have happened if, with Kyle MacLachlan? Then would he have been in the running to be Batman and Batman Forever? Oh, <laughs> like, what would he could have there? been a Batman. Would Val Kilmer have taken Kyle MacLachlan's role in the Flintstones movie? We'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite is when you said in one of them there, Val didn't want to be typecast yeah. as a hunk. That's yeah. like such a humble brag. Isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> it's... I don't want everyone thinking I'm sexy. Oh. Yeah, I guess like if you have. Or, I don't know, maybe it was like a prideful thing. I feel like yeah. my uh, watching history of Val Kilmer went from this uh, and then skip a lot of years. And then the next time I saw him was like in Deja Vu. Oh. Or so, yeah, right? With uh, Denzel Washington. He was in that movie, right? Yeah, he was the cop. And um, he had a big face. And I was like, that's Val Kilmer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think if I... I think the next thing I saw him in was Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which is, yeah, that's a hell of a lot later. It wasn't a couple of things, but I think at this point, the reputation was getting that bad because he was so difficult to work with. So I think it would have been like this heat at the same time, then yeah. the saint, and oh, the then saint. then he seems to drop off the face of the earth until like, until, yeah, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, or the, 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 day, like the mid-2000s. It's as yeah. if people were like, nah, we ain't working with this guy anymore. <laughs> yeah. like, I, I, I didn't see Heat until like, you know, a couple years ago, th- three or four years ago. I've which... never seen it. Oh, man, that's a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it's, it's good. It's a good movie. <laughs> uh, also, just because you mentioned Deja Vu with Denzel, he was offer- also offered uh, Crimson Tide, Den- Denzel Washington's role, mm. and he turned that oh, down wow. as well. <laughs> He just turns everything down. No wonder he got stopped uh, getting roles. He just says no. Well, in, in this movie, though, uh, right, Bruce, he looks out the window and spots the bat signal in the sky now. And I, I have a problem with the signal in general, which is highlighted by this. Mm-hmm. Like, it needs some kind of a siren. Right? Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, does it make a sound? Does it make a sound? Because how long has that been mm-hmm. shining there, right? <laughs> He could, and, that could have been put up 10 minutes ago, and he's only just seen it because he's been in his weird trance. <laughs> what yeah. if he's on the toilet as well? He might not see what it. What if he's in the cave? No window. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I was yeah. making a sandwich. It, it doesn't make a lick of sense. And I know this, they this did. goes across all of Batman media. So mm-hmm. it's a, you know, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, but it's, it, it is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's like the, the signal works when, like, it's already, like, you know, past midnight, and you're pretty certain Batman is in the streets you yeah know? yeah uh, and not in the sheets <laughs> um so like i think Idiot. it i, I do always do just like the signal just because i like that 20s 40s you know aesthetic kind of thing oh it um, looks incredible yeah but uh there was that one uh cartoon the batman that he had the little um 
God, they had a name for it, and I can't remember. It was called like Batware or something like that, but it was like the little brr, brr thing. It was an alarm clock for Batman, pretty much, and it was on like all his media and everything, and, and the dude knew when to be Batman. He invented the cloud. Everything yeah. being connected, everything synced. Yeah, there's Alexa. You go. I do think that is a thing, though, that, yeah, it needs to be... I think in modern day comics and stuff, they'll be like, oh, he's got so much tech stuff that he'll, he's bound to have multiple ways of like knowing yeah. to be Batman. But like, I think they kind of addressed it in uh, the last movie. I was like, oh, thank God they turned that off, though. Because like, remember, he, he first the, the signal first went off. Uh, it set off a bunch of sensors in Wayne Manor and like all these yeah. mini bat signals kept going off and were rerouted around the entire house so this giant bat symbol would shine in on top of him when he was sitting in his uh, brooding chair <laughs> oh yeah the little the mirrors and everything I yeah. that's cool that. though yeah. whereas this one he just sort of accidentally notices that it's that. Well, i guess though because yeah. he's just like oh, oh does the, the kids stand here just make sure to turn off the bat mirrors and stuff because <laughs> that would be really awkward if that goes off and he's here maybe maybe that's our headcanon now it's the only thing that makes sense it's, like, it's like Bruce is in the room when it happens, and he's just like, "Oh uh, yeah, the bat signal always shines in here." Like that's why this mansion is so cheap. Like this is only like <laughs> this place is like two sixty a month. <laughs> but like, you, know, <laughs> you think he rents? <laughs> <laughs> he's just like, I'm, all, "I'm also on a flight path." To be fair, kid, you shouldn't be staying here because this house is hell. <laughs> let me tell terrible, you, terrible, awful. And the, and the mold problem, Jesus. <laughs> I was like, you think that that goddamn butler of mine was like, what did you say, sir? I'm just cleaning up the mold again. <laughs> I like the way as well, yet again, Bruce gets Alfred to do his dirty work. He's like, right, okay, I've got to go and deal with this. You look after the boy. It's like, you took him in. You look after him. Yeah, take care of the kid. Like, I, I will if I yeah. see one, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not this 28-year-old man, surely. You don't mean him. He's like, oh, this kid's parents dying. It's all my fault. Alfred, take care of him. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Just basically giving him someone to look after indefinitely, as far as he knows. Yeah. He's like, I'll oh, send the kid on my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him I'm sorry. Send my condolences. <laughs> it's like, he couldn't really have moved in with a worse person in a way. <laughs> this man, he's, he's aloof. He's cold. He's distant. And distant in a literal sense, he's just going to be gone. Mm-hmm. You're not going to see that's, him. That's the thing, though, because they never deal with that aspect in this movie. Like, they have him, obviously, interact with him when he finds out that he's Batman and stuff. Mm-hmm. But, like, um, there's never an attempt by Bruce Wayne to bond with Dick Grayson. Like, it's just no. more like, oh, this, <laughs> yeah, now he's found out, oh, this is inconvenient for me. Whereas, like, they kind of did the same story in the, the Batman animated series, and they made a, a plot point of the fact that, like, yeah, Bruce took Dick in and then never spent any time with him. And Alfred was always like, well, maybe. You know, Bruce was obsessively looking for Tony Zuko at that point, so he could avenge the kid's parents. And then Alfred was like, well, you know, maybe what he needs right now is a friend. You should go up and freaking talk to this kid. And then there is a very nice scene. Bruce comes up to Dick in his bedroom, and he's just like, oh, so you want to go out and do something? And, you know, all this kind of stuff. Which is something that might have benefited this movie. (laughs) So again, Niall, you're calling for a three-hour cut of this film. Okay. I I end up calling for three-hour cuts of every movie that I end up analyzing. Hey, hey, amen to that. (laughs) Um, uh, That's one thing that they do, talking about another show, they do that in the Titan show where they do explore that whole... uh, Dick Grayson resentment of Batman and, you know, the the trauma that was, you know, inflicted and just thrust upon this young kid at a young age and everything. And, you know, when you finally put a mirror, when, when those characters actually get a point to look in the mirror and, you know, see like, oh, my God, what did I do? Uh, or what did he do? <laughs> it's like Robins do have that ability to blame Batman for whatever they become somewhere down the line. And I think inherently that's like a bad decision um yeah but i think like that is something that is always going to stick around yeah there's ways around it yeah obviously you know the kids you know are written to be yeah let me do that i do want to dress up in a cape and jump off a building what well, anyway it's fun if they are a kid like that kind of makes sense if he takes in i don't know a 12 year old or something because they might end up resenting him like well why did you take me in there but but they, they, Again, we've said this a lot. This is a grown man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's like this Chris O'Donnell Robin. Like it was always, it always sat weird with me in this particular movie. The next movie, I was fine with it because it's like, uh, I mean, obviously, as a yeah, when I was younger, passage of time in movies didn't mm. was not a concept of me. So it was just like, okay, Robin's just you know a guy. Yeah. You know, that's that's the guy playing. Yeah, him. It's but in this past one, that kid thing. Yeah, and this one they make a point 
to like show, especially in the beginning with him and his family and like just like a lovey <laughs> relationship where it is like a, it, you're kind of seeing that it should be like a younger kid or a guy in like his mid 20s is <laughs> that affectionate towards his trapeze artist parents and, and stuff. Yeah, I, like I of course know. you'd be sad they've been killed. Yes, but absolutely. You don't need it to. You don't need to be adopted, adopted. essentially. Yeah. <laughs> You're an adult. Yeah, like, what? why does he need anyone to look after him? Like, yeah. surely yeah. the police would, like, make sure he's okay and stuff, but he, he can go and get his own job in place. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, in talking about Dick Grayson, uh, the scene does briefly cut to Dick. Uh, and we you know, we kind of alluded to this a, a bunch of little um, yin and yang sort of aspects, you know, duality things to, uh, throughout the whole movie, which are obviously sort of like hodgepodge put in of like, oh, Two-Face and Edward Nygma's Bruce Wayne's doppelganger. And now Batman's got a partner. So he's kind of like a mini version of him and stuff. But I like the way they've done it here in that like when Dick was even first coming into the, the mansion, we talked about the two horses outside. There's two back-to-back dogs and stuff. And we're like, oh, I wonder if this is alluding to that. And then, you know, when Bruce was standing in his old trance thinking about his own parents' death, he was facing to the kind of left side of the room. And then when it cuts to Dick Grayson, he's also thinking about his parents and he's facing mm-hmm. to the right side of the room. So there's like a little, little, uh, you know, a, a, a mise en scene of, um, of yin and yang and stuff. Uh, and again, it's done quite subtly. Like it's kind of like it's there, but it's not like for this gonna... movie, especially. Subtle. Yeah. <laughs> because so other people might be like, oh, put it in a, sp- like a split screen so you see it in action and stuff. But here's yeah. so it's like no no you get the if if you know what you're looking for you you get the idea yeah you have to but, look um, at it. the music yeah. video has it it just it'll do the split screen for you it just like <laughs> but no <laughs> I do love that but um but yeah I'm um are you guys do you have anything else for this minute or do you wanna do you want, should we we get deeper into Robin next uh next next minute yeah. I mean I yeah let's do that what settling in does he need to do. <laughs> let's ponder that let's ponder that he hasn't got anything to unpack so who cares maybe it has to be like you know I need to unpack just like throws off his shoes I'm done <laughs> done yeah. exactly so that's gonna that's gonna puzzle me until Friday's episode here but uh, no otherwise I, I am good, good to go, go. <laughs> well we'll we'll do we'll do plugs and everything again on the on the next episode so just come and talk to us online come to Facebook Twitter Instagram we're on all of those and buy a t-shirt on Public. That, that helps us out and we will see you again on Friday for more Bat Minute Forever. Next time, holy manifesting moniker. As he reflects alone in his ritzy new room, the origins are revealed of a Robin's non the plume. But as a hard headed hero in hiding remains doomed and gloomed in his tidings, which doting domestic is here to do some tidying? Find out Friday. Same bat pod, different bat minute.